let's go. Welcome to the second episode of uh, Rustship, the podcast for developers who ship Rust code. I'm your host, Marco Iani, and uh, in this podcast, I interview other Rust developers to learn from their experience. And to, uh, today we have uh, Predrag with us. Hi, Predrag. Nice to have you. Hi, thanks for having me. I, I met Predrag for the first time because uh, he helped me integrate uh, cargo sem- sember checks in uh, Release Please, which is one of my open source projects. And uh, yeah, it was great working with him. And so I invited him uh, to the podcast because I wanted to know more about uh, cargo sember checks and the library that powers it, which is Trustful. So very shortly, we'll start by talking about uh, Trustful, which is a query engine for uh, any combination of data sources, right? It, it, it helps you query almost everything. And then we will talk about Cargo Semver Checks, which is a cargo plugin that scans Rust crates looking for uh, Semver violations. So I will ask questions about these two projects and we will touch on databases, GraphQL, uh, WebAssembly, Python bindings, common Semver errors that Rust maintains do. So let's start. And uh, I will ask you first to introduce yourself, Predrag. Awesome. Uh, yeah, uh, like Marco said, my name is Predrag Grafsky. I'm the maintainer of Trustfall and Cargo Semver Checks. Uh, I've been writing Rust for a few years now, but I've been programming for way longer than that. Uh, Before my current role, uh, I was a principal engineer at a fintech startup uh, that had a successful exit. And now I'm working on a startup idea that is still a little bit in in stealth mode. So uh, keep an eye on my my social media and, uh, you know, sooner or later, there will be some interesting news there, hopefully. Cool, cool. And so the first question I have for you is, what what languages were you using before uh, starting with Rust? And... How does Rust compare with with those? Yeah, I've I've ended up using quite a few languages over the years. I started with Visual Basic way back in the day, um, before it was .NET. So I, I probably just you know dated myself. Uh, but after that point, I did some C Sharp, I did some C and C plus uh, plus. I did Java, I did Python, I did CoffeeScript, you know Node.js. Uh, Python for many, many years, uh, and now here I am in, in Rust land. Rust is honestly great. Uh, I love shipping code that actually works or else it doesn't compile. Uh, I really hate being woken up at 3 a.m. by uh, failing to account for some preventable edge case, and I really love it that the compiler thinks through all of these cases or forces me to think through all of the, the cases that could break something. In a sense, I prefer having to deal with issues up front rather than having them schedule themselves on my calendar whenever they felt like it. And so from that perspective, Rust is amazing. I love low maintenance code and Rust gives me exactly everything I wanted there. It makes sense, yes. I think most of the people think that uh, you, they should use Rust because of performance, but even if I don't need performance, I use it because uh, it's amazing and uh, it, if it feels like I have control of what I'm doing and that I know how my program can fail and uh, awesome stuff like that, yes. So you, you, we will start by talking of your first, uh, the first open source project we will start talking is Trustful. And so I wanted to ask you, uh, what is Trustful? Why you created it? And uh, what problems does it solve? Yeah, Trustwall has its beginnings uh, all the way back in 2016. So I had joined this fintech startup. Uh, I was the infrastructure lead of this knowledge graph project. And the project on one hand was extremely ambitious. Uh, It was to uh, index and organize all of this financial information that we had access to, all sorts of different formats and and, data systems. And on the other hand, graph databases, even back then and, and probably still now, were quite immature, and so they were not the most reliable, the most effective, the most ergonomic kinds of systems. They had correctness issues, they had performance issues, and so it was a little bit like a like navigating a minefield to get a high performance, correct query evaluation for for all of these things. And so what we very quickly realized is that it was very difficult to use all of this 
extremely relevant, precious data that we had collected and, and so meticulously organized. And we ended up having tons of product engineers and machine learning engineers who were just kind of waiting for somebody else to help them write the correct query that would get them the data that they needed with sufficient performance and without falling into any of these pitfalls. And sort of without realizing it over, over the course of several months, I became everybody's query writer as a service for this data system that we had. You know, it was, hey, Predra, can you help me with this? And hey, Predra, can you help me with that? And that was fine, but it very clearly didn't scale, right? There was only one of me and there were many other people at the company that needed to, to make use of this, this data. So I wanted to, to put together a system that insulated people from the, the sharp edges, if you were, of the underlying data representation, right? They had some idea of this is the data that we want to get and how we want, you know, what query we want to run. And to them, it didn't really matter that the data was represented as a graph in this particular kind of graph database and had caches here and there and things like that. They just had a query and they wanted some answer and everything else was some implementation detail that wasn't particularly relevant. So I built a, a little prototype system. I showed it to a few people. They seemed happy with it. Uh, we ended up deploying it. Uh, it ended up helping us through some database migrations. Sooner or later, people realized that it wasn't just this graph database that we had an issue with. It was also SQL databases that we had problems with and uh, you know, S3 and one thing led to another. And fast forward you know, many years, uh, Trustfall is essentially the Rust rewrite of this prior open source uh, system that I built internal to this company. So uh, I left the, the FinTech startup uh, where I was. I started a Rust rewrite of the uh, open source project to the similarly open source and, and permissively licensed. And the new project is called Trustfall. It's a query language that can query any of these data sources that you know I've needed to query previously, including APIs, including databases, including machine learning models. And the overarching idea is still the same. It's there are tons of people that want to make use of the data they technically have access to. And they don't really care if it's coming from an API, from a cache, from a file, from a database, or from you know somebody answering the queries with pen and paper. They just want the data and everything else is some implementation detail. So Trustful is a mechanism to add that sort of layer of abstraction in between that makes the database and performance engineer super happy because everything runs smoothly and nobody you know, kills the database, while also making product folks or machine learning folks very happy that they can get their job done and they don't need to worry about all of the implementation details and where exactly is the data coming from. Right, yeah. I think uh, you have a, an example in your readme or in your blog where uh, like you, you do an example of a query that uh, Trustful can execute, which is like the top, uh, le the, like the top GitHub actions that uh, can, can, can be found in the top uh, Hacker News uh, post, like, right, something like that. So I was wondering uh, uh, if I have like my, the, my data or uh, my API, how do I uh, integrate this into Trustful? Currently, uh, in order to integrate a custom API into Trustful, uh, you would need to implement a, an adapter trait. So this is a way to expose data to Trustful. The way to think about Trustful is that it's kind of like a database except it doesn't know where the data is coming from. And so it needs to ask some other component. And that other component is the adapter. So this is one trait. It has four methods. Um, the methods are, in a sense, the simplest they could possibly be while also giving you all of the, the expressive power. And that's really the, the most difficult part of Trustfall to, to design. That part alone took a couple of years. So there's been a lot of, a lot of work behind the scenes for something so seemingly simple. Um, you know, as, as just one trait with, with four functions. Uh, and I've done a fair bit of work uh, over the past few months to make implementing that trait as easy as possible. So right now, the way that you'd go about implementing it is you would write a schema uh, that describes the shape of your data. So what types have which kinds of properties with, you know, string types or int types or whatever they have, and how all of those, those different types are interconnected with each other. So you'd say, you know, GitHub, um, uh, a, a Hacker News item, you know, might point to GitHub repo and that GitHub repo has uh, actions inside its workflows and so on. 
So having written that schema, there is a tool called uh, Trustfall StubGen that will generate a stub for the adapter that implements all of the different properties and edges and everything that you know needs to needs to happen, and just leaves little you know Rust strongly typed functions for you to fill in that just have to do as their implementation. And it will even generate a test case for you so that when you run cargo test in your newly generated you know Trustfall stub. It blows up very obviously if you've forgotten to fill in any of the any of the to dos that are there. So uh, obviously, there's always room to make things as simple as possible. But this is already, in my experience, not too too bad. And I've even worked with folks, you know, who are super early in their careers who who have managed to build uh, trustful adapters. So I'm I'm hopeful that you know this process is not going to be too too difficult for most people. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, and. I saw, yeah, from the readme that uh, RASTful queries look like uh, GraphQL, right? Uh, I was wondering if you are using GraphQL internally, or maybe you kept only the, the schema, and uh, why did you choose this technology? And I don't know how, how, that, how if it's performant or not. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Trustful has a funny relationship with GraphQL. When most people that have never used GraphQL before hear the word GraphQL, they think, oh, SQL, but over graphs. Got it. That makes sense. The funny thing is that's not what GraphQL is. <laughs> but that is exactly what Trustfall aims to be. So GraphQL by itself is intended to be more uh, an API layer, right? It's kind of like REST, but you have some more expressive power in terms of you can specify which fields come back. And sometimes you can combine multiple endpoints together to do something that uh, you know would require more than one round trip in, in REST. And that's super useful if uh, what you're building is, say, like a React web page or something like that. If you're driving a front end, uh, that's almost always what you want. This is unfortunately not really SQL-like, and it's not great if you have a more analytical workload or a workload more like cargo server checks, where you might want to do some, say, filtering or some aggregation or things like that that are not necessarily in the endpoints of the API that you're targeting. In vanilla GraphQL, you can't just add a filter somewhere that the endpoints didn't already account for and allow. In Trustful, that is something that you can do. You can filter wherever you want. You can do recursion. You can do left joins. You can do aggregations and, and things like that. So in that sense, Trustful gives you a lot more expressiveness. It also ends up giving you a fair bit more performance because a lot of the issues that happen with GraphQL, especially around pagination and n plus one queries and things like that, are addressed and avoided by by construction in Trustful. So Trustful is lazily evaluated. It does not require fully materializing responses, so you can just get a lazy iterator of results. That means that it's actually extremely safe to write a very expensive query because you don't have to do you know, limit 10 everywhere. You can just grab 10 things and stop iterating, and that's fine. And that is very freeing for, for engineers trying to you know, play around with it. So if you've played around with Trustful Playground, you should never really be worried about writing something that's too expensive. It's not going to blow up your computer, and it's definitely not going to blow up anything on the other side. At the same time, the reason to pick GraphQL here as opposed to something like SQL is that GraphQL syntax, the schema, the type system, the uh, autocomplete, uh, the visualizers, uh, all of this is absolutely fantastic. The developer experience is beautiful. And so I don't know if you've used a GraphQL playground to write some queries, but it's just otherworldly good. And no SQL system that I've used that did not cost an arm and a leg for the license uh, could come anywhere close in terms of how nicely packaged and integrated it is. And so Trustful, you know, being at this project that is maintained by a very small group of people couldn't really afford to build all of this developer experience tooling from scratch. We wanted to, to make use of what was already there. And so we borrowed GraphQL syntax type system, you know, syntax highlighting, autocomplete, everything, by staying as close to the GraphQL syntax as possible so that we could leverage all of this off-the-shelf tooling while also adding extensions in the places where GraphQL already had extension points. So think you know, recursion and custom you know, filtering logic and, and things like that. So you can't just take Trustful and 
plug it in in a place that already was using a GraphQL API and expect everything to work seamlessly. That's something that is on the roadmap for the future, but it does not work today. But on the flip side, if you have a system that was interacting previously with something SQL-ish, with very minimal work, you can make it work with Trustfall. And this is maybe a little bit of a hot take or personal preference, but I think that if you have a, a moderately complex query, it's a lot easier to read the nesting logic of GraphQL where you can see where everything is coming from as opposed to reading something that has you know, 20 or 30 joins and you have to worry about, you know, am I grabbing the right field from the right place? I agree, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I, I use GraphQL in the past, and for complex uh, APIs, it's more more pleasant to work with with respect to REST, for example, uh, HTTP REST API, because yeah, as you said, uh, it gives you autocomplete. Uh, like you, at, at compile time, if you use REST, you can verify that uh, the the query you're building uh, reflects the schema. So I guess you have the same experience in. Uh, in Trustful. And so if I understood correctly, you're not using GraphQL internally. So you don't have a Gra GraphQL server, but you're just using GraphQL for the syntax and the tooling. OK, that's, uh, that's awesome, I see. Yeah, exactly. And Trustful, in a sense, aims to be kind of like LLVM in that it has a GraphQL front end, so it understands GraphQL syntax, but it turns that into internal representation that actually has nothing to do with GraphQL or, or anything like that. And so in principle, you know, tomorrow or next month, uh, we could add a SQL front end there and compile to the same internal representation or you know, the next greatest thing that hasn't been invented yet and, and still make all of that work with all of the adapters that people in the community have built and published or with you know, compilation to SQL or to GraphQL or to some other system uh, in the back. Trustfall really, you know, in its present form is sort of one thing, but it really aims to be a Swiss army knife, if you will, of, of the data world. Because we didn't want to be constrained by the our chosen method of execution, our chosen syntax, or anything like that. These things evolve over time, and being, you know, part of the Rust ecosystem means that we have to plan for the long run because that's, you know... When you have highly maintainable code, you can afford to do that, right? Your project doesn't just bit rot into oblivion every three months. Yeah, definitely. And um, so I wanted to ask also why, uh, where the trustful name comes from? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a it's a bit of an inside joke. Um, trustful. When people hear about it, they go. That sounds impossible. I mean, if what you're pitching is the holy grail of data, right? I can just query any API, any system for one place. And the answer is actually kind of yes. Cool. <laughs> um, and so the name Trustful is is kind of a hat tip to, to that. It's, it's one of those, you kind of have to see it to believe it, and you kind of have to commit to, to the bit uh, in order to experience it, because it sounds too good to be true. And that's part of why I ended up building Cargo Sample Checks as a very public demonstration of, you know, if Trustfall is actually so good as I, I say it is, then something like Cargo Sample Checks should be really easy to build, right? Uh, and so far, you know, fingers crossed, uh, that, that has panned out, thankfully. Um, but yeah, so Trustfall, you have to commit to experience it, and hopefully you're right. And so far, that, that has panned out. <laughs> Nice, yeah. I think it's a it's a great name. Uh, yeah, now that I know the meaning, I like it even more. And uh, yeah, I think that cargo sample checks uh, really shows the power of trustful. Um, also, you have a demo that uh, uh, allows you to run trustful in the browser, right? And uh, if I understood correctly, trustful is compiled uh, via WebAssembly, so everything runs in your browser basically. And uh, like you have. You, you can run uh, Acker News queries uh, and so on. So I wanted to ask you uh, what how was the process to uh, say compile uh, Trustful to WebAssembly and uh, yeah, if, if uh, any, any insight there. Yeah. Honestly, I feel like that process highlighted one of the best things about the Rust ecosystem, which is the 
almost obsessive level with high quality tooling and good developer experience. Because I'm not the world's biggest expert about browser technology and definitely not WebAssembly, quite quite far from it. But I was able to just, you know, install a tool, follow an online tutorial, fiddle with things for a few hours, and I got stuff running in the browser. So that's just amazing. So I used Wasm BindGen, which handles almost essentially everything that, that I needed. And I just needed to define some wrapper types, decorate them with some attributes, and just use a build tool that made a JavaScript file that I stuck into uh, into a, a web for, uh, you know a, a website. And then I had a couple of friends who are a little bit more knowledgeable about front end things put together a little React app because that's not that's not my forte. Uh, but overall, the process was was extremely extremely smooth. Um, which is not to say that you know that there weren't some slightly sharp edges. Uh, the whole lazy evaluation model is a little bit tricky to to generate. Uh, definitions files for TypeScripts for, because the control has to pass between the um, the adapter, which is written in TypeScript in that case, and runs directly in the browser and is asynchronous and uh, uses fetch uh, APIs to communicate with uh, the Hacker News API upstream. And uh, on the other hand, talk to Trustfall and WebAssembly so these two things need to, to exchange a lot of data back and forth. And there's obviously a little bit of complexity there. So I needed to do a little bit of this work manually. But to be perfectly honest, given how complex the, the whole thing is, the amount of work that I needed to, to do to get all of this running end to end was shockingly small. It was at least an order of magnitude less than I, than I would have thought it would have been. So, you know, two thumbs up. If I had any more thumbs, I would I would give even more thumbs up for for the state of, you know, embedding Rust in as WebAssembly in a web browser. It was absolutely amazing. Yeah, it's it's I think Rust has many use cases. I can bet that the uh, desktop uh, UIs, backend development and so on. And uh, yeah, Wasm is uh, another one which I think it's probably the language the best language that has the best support for WebAssembly. So um, I'm excited to see more uh, about that, yes. So you mentioned that you can write adapters, trustful adapters also in TypeScript, and I saw also in Python. How many, <laughs> how is it like, how many languages do you support? Yeah, right now it's Rust, uh, TypeScript, and JavaScript, obviously, through the uh, WASM bindings. And then Python, in principle, the same approach that worked for Python and for WASM and, and TypeScript should work for any other language. Uh, there's just a little bit of usually FFI um, type of uh, code that needs to be written, and then any other language could sit on the other side. You could also implement the adapter trait by making function calls to some remote server or doing you know Unix pipes locally or, or anything like that. So really, the sky is the limit about what languages could be the data providers to Trustfall versus Trustfall running the query. And this is also really beautiful because it means that most of the time, you don't really have to worry about the query engine itself. The query engine itself is going to be rather fast. So, so long as you can feed it data fast enough from the underlying data source, you know, API files, database, whatever it might be, the engine itself is written in Rust. The Rust compiler is quite good about squeezing performance out of, out of Rust code. And so the Trustfall compiler itself is almost never the bottleneck in, in anything. And even you know, in Cargo Sanford Checks, I've done a fair bit of, of work optimizing. And all of the work around optimizations was around feeding data to Trustfall more efficiently and not let's make Trustfall itself faster, which is honestly great because I have a lot more time to add these bindings, especially when they provide a lot of value, like in Cargo Sanford Checks, than I would have uh, around optimizing you know, 10,000 different little database implementations if I was trying to build an entire database, you know, by a database by another name for each of these data sources separately, right? It's a lot easier to take one thing and optimize it heavily and then apply it to 10,000 different data sources than it is to separately optimize 10,000 different, not quite databases in their in their own right. Absolutely, yes. So you said that you, you 
you integrated you integrated JavaScript uh, adapters by using Wasm. Instead, I'm curious how you integrated the Python adapters too. Yeah, I used the PyO3 crate, and the story was very, very similar. Uh, installed the crate, followed an online tutorial, didn't really dig in too much into the details. Uh, I ran some commands on the shell, and a Python package came out the other end. Um, so just minimal, you know, add a few attributes here and there. Uh, I have a combined Rust and Python crate slash package. And all of this is managed by the tooling. It's completely transparent to the user. So the user can write an adapter in Python and be completely none the wiser that the rest of the system is, is built in Rust and that there's any sort of FFI and communication going on. So honestly, shockingly good developer experience, both for me as the maintainer and I think for, for downstream consumers. Uh, I get, you know, convenient, strongly typed, borrow checked Rust code, and the users get type hinted Python, and everyone is happy. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that providing uh, the ability to write adapters in other languages is great because you empower everyone to, to use Trustful, which, uh, which is great, yes. And so le let's talk about like the, the, the crate that your crate that uses Trustful, which is Cargo Semver Check, right? Uh, tell us a bit more about it. Yeah, the idea behind the crate is that semantic versioning is something that is very difficult to get right in, in uh, Rust. And at the same time, it's very painful when it goes wrong because it's unfortunate for maintainers. They now have to scramble and, and deal with this fire drill that sort of was unscheduled and just generally stressful as a situation. And on the other hand, everyone that is using their crate also has an unscheduled fire drill because now their projects are broken and they're failing to compile and they have to pin to a lower version. And it's just not great. It's especially bad when you have a crate that has a lot of downstream consumers because now that, that work is duplicated and amplified, you know, times a hundred or times a thousand, you know, for every one of its, its dependencies, whether or not they realize that they were depending on that project, right? Because transitive dependencies are also affected. And so Cargo Sanford Checks is, a, is an attempt to make the situation better, not really by trying to take any sort of control away from maintainers, but more by detecting common issues and then warning maintainers about what might happen if they go forward with the publish. So if you've ever tried to run Cargo Publish in a repository that has some uncommitted changes, you might have noticed that Cargo Publish will say, hey, I think you have some uncommitted changes. If you're sure you want to go forward, pass the, the flag to override it, and you can, you can still publish. But I'm warning you so that you didn't say you didn't know what was happening. I kind of think of Cargo Sanford Checks as a similar sort of tool. So it's designed so that you can run Cargo Sanford Checks right before you run Cargo Publish. And Cargo Sanford Checks will say, hey, I found these things that don't seem in line with the kind of version bump that you're attempting to publish. But of course, if you think that's completely right to, to do, by all means, go ahead and publish, right? It's just, you never want to be on the hook for dealing with the fallout of an issue that a tool could have warned you ahead of time for, and that had you known, you might have changed your mind and, and done something different. So that's, that's kind of the mindset that I, I have about it, that you know, a rest station, I said this on, on social media a few weeks ago, a rest station is, is someone who really hates being told, yes, everything's fine in a situation where they might regret it later. Absolutely, yes. Uh, yeah, as a user who like run cargo update on their, on their project and uh, saw something breaking, I, I really appreciate uh, the effort you're putting into Cargo Sember Check. I think it's, uh, it's a great tool. Like uh, I'll, I'll try to, like the for example to, to explain to to, other, to users the to listeners like for example say that you have a public method and uh, like I don't know you you rename it or you add another field to it you run cargo semver check and it tells you oh uh, this method was there was here before but now it's uh, it's no longer here so if you if you want to do a cargo publish, make sure to do a breaking change, yes. And uh, yeah, I think it's uh, it's great because uh, it's one of those things when you say, oh yeah, uh, you just need to 
be uh, like focused and review everything you've done. Uh, but like in reality, everyone can have a bad day and uh, then you, you need to yank the version. So it, it's, a, it's a great tool. And I think I believe that also there is a, some effort to integrate it into Cargo, right? That's right. Um, the Cargo team has been incredibly helpful with Cargo Sanford Checks. And the plan is to make it run by default before Cargo Publish. So exactly like the, the uncommitted changes check. Uh, there's obviously some some work remaining to, to be done around that. Uh, most of the work is just adding more lints so that we can be more confident in, in its assessment, uh, eliminating some of the, the remaining uh, false positives, especially around things like doc hidden, where the, you know, what is public API and what is not public API has some tricky edge cases. And then just stabilizing the API because Rust is very, very committed to, to stability. And so the CLI and the API that the tool offers need to be in a very stable sort of place so that other people can build additional tooling on top of this. Awesome. Awesome. And uh, so to understand a bit how uh, Cargo Sember check works under the hood, uh, I would like to ask you, how is this tool different from previous attempts to solve this problem in the Rust ecosystem? Absolutely. Um, the interesting thing is that the thing that Cargo Sanford Checks does differently or that's new about it is not usually the, the first thing that comes to mind. There are other tools built previously like Semverver that could also detect breaking changes correctly and that could point out the, the problematic code and, and things like that. The issue with a lot of those tools was not one of low performance or of inability to detect breaking changes. It was the cost of maintenance, the sort of day-to-day -day cost to keep the lights on, to keep the tool working, you know, to keep it working as well tomorrow as it was yesterday. And the reason that cost is so high is because all of the data sources that uh, these sorts of tools need to use to detect breaking changes are completely unstable. Uh, there, are, there are sort of two, two different approaches to, to take here. One is reach directly into Rust C APIs, which change, I mean, almost quite literally day to day, or to use Rust doc JSON, which is slightly more stable, but not really a lot more stable. It's, it's more stable in the sense of it only breaks on average once every minor new Rust version, right? So roughly call it once a month or once every every six weeks. And so a lot of these prior projects ended up being deprecated, not because they couldn't get the job done, but because a substantial fraction, I mean, you can count PRs and it's something like 20 or 30% of all of their PRs were just update to the newer version of things, update to the newer version of things, update to the newer version of things, right? So that's an unsustainable level of effort just to keep the lights on without adding any sort of new functionality, without fixing existing bugs, just day-to-day, -day, you know, minimum viable, keep everything going uh, kind of work. So the key innovation in Cargo Sanford Checks is not one of functionality or performance, it's that we have massively reduced the amount of day-to-day -day maintenance that is necessary. And the way that we have done this is by making it so that the business logic of detecting breaking changes is completely separate from how we access that data to, to evaluate whether there was a breaking change. And the wildcard factor, you know, the, our ace in, in upper sleeve here is Trustful. The way that this works is Trustful sits in between the data source, which in our case is Rustadog JSON and the business logic of Semverlints, which are just written as queries over uh, a data model that is completely abstract. So it's not bound to, this is what the specific shape of the JSON document that we're looking at is. Can you explain a bit what's uh, RustDoc JSON? Yeah, absolutely. So RustDoc is a Rust tool that is built into, that, that ships together with the, the Rust tool chain that is able to generate uh, documentation using compiler APIs. So it, it's what powers DocsRS, for example. Uh, DocsRS uh, is using HTML output uh, for the crate. So it shows you know, all of the APIs as a web page. It also has an unstable mode of generating that same documentation as JSON. And 
Uh, that's unstable because the Rust language itself is also growing, right? So it would be kind of terrible if we said this format is handed down forever and now there is no more adding, you know, new Rust functionality because we can't, you know, add it anywhere to, to this format. Um, so, of course, there's a little bit of tension here, right? If we worked harder towards stabilizing Rust.json, it will make it harder to evolve the Rust language. If we made it easy to evolve the Rust language, which I think we is something that we do want to do, that means that Rust.json is less stable and there are more changes that we need to account for. And so building this kind of tooling becomes a little bit more difficult. So that's that's really where Cargo Semver Checks uh, ended up being a little bit new there. I see. So basically, uh, the Rust.json file is a JSON file that summarizes what you see on docs RS. So it says your public methods, your public uh, modules, structs, and so on. So you build uh, an adapter for Trustful to query this uh, Rust.json. And even if, like, you, you wrote also queries that uh, each query corresponds to a, a rule. So you say the yeah, like we said, if the name of the method changes, then it's a, it's a breaking change. And so even if the rust.json format changes, you just need to edit the Rustful adapter, but the queries stays the same, right? Right, exactly. And so what previously was a sort of quadratic complexity problem, because one needed to update every query for every bit of format change, now is a linear problem because we have queries and the adapter, and we just update the adapter, and the queries become remain blissfully ignorant of any sort of format changes. So the queries are written quite literally at a level of if there was a public function in your public API in the previous version, try to uh, uh, find cases where there isn't that same you know that same public function does not exist in the public API of the new version. And this kind of query written at this level has no, you know, no ability to perceive the underlying format. And so it's completely insensitive to the changes because the changes to Rust stock JSON are not, you know, Rust has functions today and doesn't have them tomorrow, right? That, that is not the kind of breaking change that happens in Rust stock JSON. Instead, the kinds of changes are we renamed this field or we moved this piece of data from here to there. And those are the kinds of things that don't really affect our abstracted sort of view of the world, view of the APIs that we're, we're trying to query. And Trustfall is that level of abstraction that uh, allows us to have this clear separation between how we write these queries and how that data actually gets there and, and gets processed uh, to make all of that work. Awesome. I would like also to do a call, call to action for our listeners. I like, I, I saw the queries of uh, some queries of Trustful and of uh, Cargo Semver Checks. And they are, I think they are easy to read and easy to write. So if somebody wants to contribute to Cargo Semver Checks, maybe by adding uh, new new queries, uh, Predrag is, uh, is an awesome maintainer. I contributed uh, some stuff to Cargo Semver Checks. So I highly recommend also because uh, like your code can, can be part of Cargo itself one day if if we had uh, uh, a bunch of queries there. So uh, it's awesome. Um, I wanted Absolutely. to ask. Thank you. I wanted and, to ask. Yeah, sorry. Uh, and uh, just to sort of further encourage people, hopefully, uh, adding a new check is as simple as just writing one file that just contains the error message to show to people when you know something broken is discovered a trustful query that describes how to find the thing. So that would be find public functions that used to exist and that no longer exist, for example. Uh, obviously not in English in query syntax, but that's something you can prototype in the playground uh, and you get the benefit of uh, autocomplete and, and all of those nice you know, 21st century developer experience uh, kinds of benefits. And these kinds of uh, new lints are added all the time. And people with all sorts of levels of experience with Rust and programming have contributed successfully, including folks who are still in college, including you know people super early in their careers. So this is really open to anyone of, of all skill levels. You just need to 
be willing to you know take a look at how how these things are done or ask questions when something is unclear please feel free to ping me and i'm i'm very happy to help and mentor great um uh, i wanted to ask you uh what are the limitations of this approach by uh, that you using uh, rust.json if if there are some limitations i don't know i'm thinking about for example performance so like parsing big uh, json files stuff like this yeah, definitely. Um, I, I want to say that the Rust, the folks working on Rust doc have been incredibly helpful and very open to, to suggestions. We've had a very close collaboration, and so you know, obviously, any any kind of system is is going to find some friction here and there, but they've been very receptive to feedback, and I mean, we're working on on resolving all of the things that that we find. So absolutely zero complaints there. I have nothing but but good things to say. For the most part, uh, obviously performance can always be better. Thankfully, semantic versioning violations are painful enough that even if it takes a few extra seconds to to sever check your, your crate, that is almost always going to be worth it. You know, it's not running uh, in the C the sort of the hot path of your CI loop, right? It's not necessarily running on every PR, although we're hoping to to get it there as well. So a few extra seconds here and there are not usually a problem. And you know, build caching is helpful, so a lot of this stuff gets gets reused. For a brand new clean build, obviously the build itself takes a few seconds, but that's not specific to Rust doc. That's just Rust in general. And yes, parsing a, a big file can can also take a few seconds. But again, that's that's not really the the biggest issue. Um, the biggest limitation that we that we today have is uh, cargo sample checks uh, and Rust stock are a little bit limited in terms of how much they can see uh, items from other crates. So it's quite difficult actually to link uh, one crate to another crate through Rust stock JSON. Uh, and there's some subtlety here around, you know, what if there are multiple versions of the same crate in the same workspace? How do we know which of those versions to point to and then generate that, that new Rust stock file? And how does all of this get interconnected? Fortunately, because Trustfall is in the loop here, once we're able to solve these sort of infrastructural concerns of how do we get the right metadata in the right places in, in all of these Rust stock files, we'll be able to plug all of that data into the Trustfall adapter. And so the queries are going to get that capability for free. So we're not really digging ourselves into any sort of maintenance hole here. Uh, but it is a limitation. And so Cargo Sember Checks today is not actually able to Sember check whether your re-exports from a third-party crate uh, are still adhering to Sember. It just completely does not see those at all. It's as if they don't exist. And so any breaking changes in those will not currently be reported. Uh, and this is sort of in general true of cargo server checks. If cargo server checks finds an issue, odds are it's actually an issue, otherwise it's a bug. If cargo server checks says everything's fine, it's actually possible that it's a false positive because we have 50 plus lints that we already have implemented, but we also know that there are hundreds of lints that we haven't implemented yet. And so that's where that, that call to action of please come and help write us some more lints uh, is super important. Uh, we keep adding those uh, on, you know, in every new release. But obviously, even though we have a lot and the tool can catch a lot of stuff already and it's super useful, there's obviously a lot more stuff that it could do in the future. I see. Uh, so uh, you said that uh, you don't you don't catch if uh, you, you don't catch violations of other crates. So if your crate re-exports. Another type, another another crate. So, for example, I don't know. You are uh, Axum, for example, a web framework, and you export HTTP. You don't see if HTTP uh, did a breaking change, but can can this be solved by uh, running cargo server checks in both crates? Or yes. So uh, if uh, you run cargo server checks on HTTP itself, you'll be able to find. Uh, breaking changes there and make sure that Semver is adhered to. The part that will not get caught right now is, let's say hypothetically, that Axum were to upgrade from one major version of the HTTP crate to another major version of the HTTP crate. That re-export is now re-exporting a completely new major version, which is in itself a breaking change. 
And this is something that cargo server checks will not report. So this is a case where the HTTP crate by itself is completely server compliant, but the re-exported crate in Axum has a different major version, which is itself a breaking change because now you know, Rust thinks that the types are not the same types because they come from different major versions of the same crate. And that is not something that Cargo Server Checks today will be able to flag for you. I see. Uh, yeah, I, 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 um, I would say that it's, it's great to have the ability to, in your dependencies, have different versions of the same crate. But at the same time, it can be painful. Yeah. Um, yeah. I wanted to, to ask you, since like uh, Semver violations are uh, your daily job, basically. Uh, what advices uh, would you give to Rust maintainers in the sense that, like, what are the most common errors that they do when releasing new packages? Yeah. The most important thing to remember, I think, is that Semver violations happen to everyone. So don't take it too seriously if, if one happens to your crate. You know, there, there are only two kinds of Rust developers out there, the ones that have already gotten unlucky and have published a Semver violation, and the ones that haven't yet gotten unlucky and published a Semver violation. Uh, this is a tooling problem. It's not a, it's not a people problem, right? It's not a sign of lack of skill, a lack of dedication, anything like that, if, if something like this happens to slip by and, and get published. So don't feel bad about, about it if that happens to you. Obviously, use the best tooling at your disposal, things like Clippy and Cargo Sever Checks and, and other awesome tooling in, in Rust. Uh, all of those things can help you, but they can't really you know, guarantee 100% that uh, everything, everything ends up you know, working out and, and that you never publish any bugs, right? No single tool is 100% solution to, to anything, right? But between Cargo Clippy and Cargo Server Checks and Cargo Test and, and all of these different uh, dev tools, we can do a pretty so solid job of, of making sure that those unfortunate accidents don't happen particularly often. The most common Semver violations that I've seen are the ones where you have situations where there was a guarantee that you weren't realizing that you were making that then gets violated. And this happens in two different ways. One is when you have exhaustive types. So say that you have an enum that is not marked non-exhaustive. Adding a new variant is a breaking change because anyone that was using it, say, to pattern match, now has to add the new variant, right? Uh, another more sneaky one is that if you have a public struct that has completely public fields, right? So it has no private fields anywhere. Any field addition to that struct is also a breaking change. Even a public field, even a private field, always a breaking change. And so again, you, if you had realized that you were doing this, you could have marked your, your public struct non-exhaustive, and that would have saved you some headache down the road. Unfortunately, you know, maybe you didn't do that. And so now adding non-exhaustive is itself a breaking change, as is adding a new private or public field to that struct. And so unfortunately, you're a little, you're in a little bit of a tight corner there. And that is itself a little bit of room for further improvements. I would love to have either Cargo Sever Checks or another similar tool warn you when you're adding a new public type to your public API to say, hey, maybe you want to make this non-exhaustive because non-exhaustive now is not a breaking change, but non-exhaustive tomorrow will be. So just make sure that you really meant to make this exhaustive. And we see a similar problem with auto traits as well, where something was send or sync or unwind safe is a is a is a good one that trips up a lot of people, uh, where your type was send or sync or unwind safe and you didn't necessarily realize it and you didn't maybe even mean to make it that, but now changing some internal implementation detail makes it no longer be one of those auto traits and now that's a breaking change and you're surprised to see it in cargo sample checks. Or worse, you're surprised to wake up and it's on it's on a uh, GitHub issue one day. <laughs> Can you explain what are uh, auto traits? Absolutely. So, uh, Rust has this amazing feature where if your code was uh, safe to use in a multi-threaded environment, uh, this is encoded in the type system via these traits called send and sync. Uh, essentially, they are whether they're saying whether 
A particular type is safe to be used from more than one thread at the same time or to be passed from one thread to another thread. Now, if you had a type that was previously thread safe and that type is no longer thread safe, this is a major breaking change in every programming language out there. This is not unique to Rust. This is true in Java and C Sharp and, and every other language that I've ever written. But Rust is the only one in which this becomes a failure at compile time rather than something that somebody is dismayed to discover leads to a race condition or a use after free, you know, the hard way in production at 3 a.m. So uh, they have this unfortunate tendency in, in some ways that the compiler makes types, uh, marks types thread safe by automatically implementing these traits, send and sync, if every one of the components of the type, so all of the fields, all of the variants, whatever, uh, are also themselves send and or sync. That also unfortunately means that if you have an implementation detail of an implementation detail of your type that has stopped being thread safe, that sort of propagates through your entire type system end to end. And now you can have a private you know, change in a private type somewhere escalate and break your public API in a completely different file, maybe even in a completely different crate. And now you're you're left in this situation where you've accidentally broken a promise that you've made to your users that these types are going to be thread safe and, and safe to use. Now, Rust will warn you about this ahead of time, right? So that's good. It's better than debugging a race condition. It's also unfortunate, though, that you maybe didn't realize that you were making this, this promise to begin with and that you know, a, a tool like Cargo Sember Checks can can at least warn you about what you're going to do so that you can act appropriately rather than uh, finding out about this via compiler error in your crate or, or in someone else's crate later down the line. Yeah, so yeah, Rust uh, shifts uh, the, the issue from runtime to compile time. So for example, if you send, if you, if you send uh, a, a struct which is not read safe among different threads, the compiler will tell you you're doing it wrong. And uh, yeah, this is something I really appreciate about R Rust because like normally in other programming languages, like for example, Java and so on, you need to read the documentation to check if, for example, that hash map is thread safe instead with Rust, you're, uh, you're confident of, more confident of what you're doing. And uh, right. it's amazing, yes. And as we all know, nobody really reads the documentation in practice. Uh, so it, it's a lot better, in my opinion, that the compiler enforced this, just like the borrow checker, especially because these bugs are incredibly difficult, incredibly painful, incredibly expensive to debug when they happen in production. Uh, if you've never debugged a, a race condition or a use after free in production, honestly, try to keep it that way. <laughs> it's not fun. Zero out of 10 would not recommend. Absolutely. So you you said you you said your uh, uh, your advice is for uh, maintainer to not violate uh, server checks. I was wondering if you have also advices for uh, maintainers who want to start their own open source projects, uh, especially with Rust in in general. Any advice for them? Absolutely. In my experience, a very strong predictor of how long you're going to be able to sustain working on an open source project is how easy to maintain it is. And we've seen this in projects that, that span the gamut, everything from you know, Semper checking to you know, various compilers and, and very ambitious other projects in, in not just the Rust ecosystem, but everywhere. If it becomes tedious to keep the lights on day to day, if it's difficult to make contributions, to make uh, the project, you know, keep working, pass tests, things like that. It's going to be very difficult to remain motivated, to be honest, to continue upholding that project. You never really want to be in a situation where there's something that you have to do and you really don't feel like doing it. And I found, at least for me, it's very important to add a lot of emphasis on how am I going to make this very easy to maintain, very easy to test, have very fast, very good CI that catches all sorts of issues that I'm likely to find. Uh, and to have really good answers to, to these questions, maybe even spend a disproportionately large amount of time and effort having really good answers very early on in the project. So I can tell you a specific example of, of this from uh, Trustfall. 
where Trustfall currently has something like 800 unit tests uh, that test everything end to end in a sort of clever arrangement. They take only about a second to run. I have a script to uh, that takes an input query file and runs it through the entire compiler, through all of the stages of the compiler, and generates every intermediate step of every sort of stage of processing of the compiler. So an internal representation, a trace file of the execution, you know, any errors or outputs that were generated and all of this stuff. All of this stuff gets saved as files. They get committed into the repository and then get checked. Uh, they, they get checked in and then get checked on, on every commit. This is magical. Why? Because it's very easy for me to add new test cases, right? I just write a new query. I run the script. The script checks in, you know, half a dozen different files, automatically created, you know, the snapshots. The behavior is pinned down. Trustful is a deterministic compiler, so the same outputs happen every single time. And it also means that my unit tests are actually integration tests in a funny way, because the way that the tests are set up is uh, we take the input to every stage. We run it through that stage. We get some result. We deserialize the expected result. We compare those two for equality. But there's another test that takes the expected output of that stage, uses it as input to the next stage, and tests there. And same for the stage after that, and same for the stage after that. And so by composition, we can actually see that the same input produces the same final result. While at the same time, if something is broken, we don't have to go debug an integration test that is broken somewhere in between. We see, aha, the you know, exact output changed between you know, point A and point B. And so this is where the problem must be, right? Not over there and not over there. And that's really, really nice. And it's super nice to be able to just run cargo tests and have instant feedback one second later over this gigantic test suite. And so that means that Trustful is very unlikely to have bugs, which means that I don't spend a lot of time triaging things and debugging things and, and things like that. It also means that when a bug does happen, it's quite easy to reproduce. Just write a buggy query, save the results, fix the bug, see how everything changed, check in the, the uh, generated files, and that bug is never, ever coming back. And this enables a very virtuous feedback loop where development is fast, and so it's bug-free, and so it's fast, and so it's bug-free. And so there are a lot of features that are bug-free, and so people use it and find more bugs. And this is a, a very, very positive feedback loop, which results in happy users and a happy productive maintainer, because I don't have to debug things you know, all the time for everyone. <laughs> That's really impressive. Congrats. It's a... Uh... It's, yeah, it's, it sounds like a dream to work uh, on on a project like this. That yeah, congrats. Uh, I wanted to ask you: Are there any libraries that you are using in this process that makes makes it easier? To yeah, uh, I use Sturdy to uh, serialize and deserialize all of the inputs and expected outputs. I really write like the RON uh, format. It's kind of like JSON, but for Rust, it's Rusty object notation. Uh, and so that means that it's very explicit about enum variants and ex you know, specific types. Like, uh, is this number an integer or a float? You know, is it an, I40, uh, an I64 or a U64? All of these things, which, uh, which matter quite a bit uh, for a compiler system and, and you know, that wants to be strongly type safe. Um, so it's been very pleasant to, to debug with those. Uh, and honestly, just in general, every crate that I've used in the Rust ecosystem has had such a high quality bar, especially coming from you know, some of these other ecosystems that I've used stuff in. Obviously, every ecosystem has some extremely high quality uh, crates. But in Rust, you know, if you just grabbed a random crate off of crates.io, Odds are it has a very solid test suite and good documentation, and everything is like nicely thought out, and the API is pleasant to use. And so, uh, just in general, you know, Wasm, BindGen, PyO3, I've been absolutely blown away by by how easy it is to use these things. And in turn, that makes it easy to build uh, things like uh, um, cargo server checks. Right, building Trustfall adapters is super easy because. I don't have to muck about with how is this JSON format deserialized. It's, you know, 
the Rust doc uh, component for Rust has a certain definition for uh, the types that it generates. So that's strongly typed. There's a create uh, creates IO create that exports the thirty definitions. That means that I can just grab that crate and just reuse it. And so that means that if the format changes, that's a compile time, you know, compile error. So it's just caught immediately. If cargo check passes when on the new format, everything is great. Almost certainly everything is fine. If something is not fine, the test suite catches it anyway. It's it's again one of those very pleasant positive feedback loops where everything just keeps working. So it's an absolute dream to to be developing in this ecosystem. Nice, yes. Yeah, I agree that like the average quality of, of a library in Rust is is pretty high because just the fact that it compiles, you know that like uh, it's uh, uh, trade safe, uh, uh, it, it doesn't have memory issues and so on. So yeah, in general, I had very few issues with the, with Rust libraries. Yes, we have a question from the chat uh, from Arun. Uh, he asks. I'm just curious about how was your experience promoting your open source projects? Any tips, advice? Yeah, um, it's definitely it's definitely a little bit tricky. It's always, uh, you know, building comes naturally to a lot of us and promoting our, our work can be difficult. It can often be uncomfortable, you know, to sort of put yourself out there. Um, I think the, the most important thing to keep in mind is that the community is very welcoming. People generally are very happy and supportive of new projects. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be polished. You know, especially if you tell people up front, hey, this is something I, I started working on. It's not perfect yet, but what do you think? People are going to be very accepting. So just feel free to put your stuff out there. Um, r slash Rust has been a very positive community for me. So I, I wrote some blog posts uh, about cargo server checks, about Trustfall, and I put them on r slash Rust generally got very positive feedback on on a lot of that stuff you know people actually engaged dug in and you know took a look and and were generally very very supportive and helpful uh, and often even offered advice and, and made concrete suggestions you know even sometimes made pull requests to to fix issues so that was very very helpful for me it's especially helpful if when you write a blog post you explain the motivation for why you're building the tool that you're building right so answer, what is the problem that you're solving? Why no other tool solves that problem? Or if another tool solves the problem, how is your thing any different? You know, what other thing are you exploring? Sort of what are the tenets of your project that might make somebody pick it over something else, if there is even something else? And as much as it is a bit of a tired trope, you know, explaining it like, you know, it's X for Y uh, can often be helpful for people to sort of just get in the right sort of mindset, right? So explaining, you know, Trustfall, like it's a query engine, but over any data source, right? It's not a hundred percent correct uh, explanation, right? There's obviously some nuance here and there, but it gets you sort of in the right mindset. And then you can explain all of the nuances and, and how things are different. But at the end of the day, the most important thing is just getting your stuff out there, not being afraid to, to speak up about your work, you know, write blog posts, post about it on social media, uh, post about it on r slash rust. And honestly, just don't take detractors too seriously because if they don't like it, they're free to not use it, right? What's the worst that can happen? They can have 100% of their money back for not using your open source project, right? Um, and of course, there's always going to be some places, I think Hacker News is, is somewhat deservedly famous for this, where People might not necessarily take uh, too deep of a look into your project and might be like, oh, this is terrible and this is completely incorrectly designed and you know, is a terrible fit. This happens to me a few weeks ago. Cargo Sever Checks was on the front page of Hacker News and somebody was like, this project is terrible and the way that it should actually work is and proceeded to explain exactly the same way that Cargo Sever Checks works, right? And do your best to stay positive and you know, be constructive. So. I jumped in with a comment and I said, hey, that's actually exactly what Cargo Sanford Checks does. The one place where it doesn't, it's actually explicitly planned to do that in a future version. You know, we just haven't gotten around to it yet. You know, thank you for the feedback kind of thing. And sometimes people will say, oh yeah, totally like, you know, thank you. Or like, I misread it or I misunderstood. Sometimes they might just double down. Uh, they might say, 
you're completely wrong. You didn't even read the readme. That's what happens to me. Uh, in that situation, again, don't take it too seriously. I, I you know, broke open the metaphorical popcorn and enjoyed the show because somebody else then pointed out to, to this user that I was actually the author of the crate. I wrote the readme. And so accusing me of not having read the readme is a little bit, is a little bit funny. Um, I, I totally understand that this is uncomfortable. Um, this is something that is just going to happen. You know, it's it's a big world out there. And uh, if you're not really, you know, ready for this, then just don't check Hacker News for for your projects. And I think that's that's totally fine. I found that r slash Rust and, you know, generally the Rust circles and on social media are very, very supportive. So don't be afraid to to put your work out there, even if it isn't perfect, I think. People, for the most part, are super nice, and the the few oddball people that maybe are are not going to dig into your projects too deeply, you don't really have to pay them too much mind. Yeah, I like I tried to post something on Acker News, but I my posts get lost in the in the void. <laughs> Instead, yeah, I found the the Reddit Trust community, uh, like more uh, interested, of course, in Rust, but yeah, in general, I found it welcoming. Yeah. They, I, I recommend to share your uh, your stuff there. Also, because if you only share it in your via your socials, you always end up reaching your bubble. Instead, if you go to other websites, uh, you reach more people, of course. Yes, and uh, sometimes it's it's hard to to share your projects because, like, you, I don't know, you feel a bit guilty that you're spamming and so on, but you need to to go over this feeling. And uh, yeah, you need to spam. A hundred percent agreed. And I feel like, you know, it's completely fine to once every few weeks, once a month, you know, say, hey, I wrote a blog post about a new thing that I built in my project. I don't think anybody's going to blame you for that. You know, in the worst case, people just keep scrolling and that's fine. A lot of the time, though, people are genuinely curious. They will want to know uh, what sorts of things you've been up to, especially if there's an interesting challenge that you overcame that might be helpful to them. You know, if you can frame it as here is an unusual solution I had to a problem or, you know, tell people why they should read your blog posts. Tell people why you're excited about it. Most of the time, people respond to enthusiasm with enthusiasm. And so I feel like people are a lot more accepting of you know, quote unquote spam, if it's not really spam, if it's genuine content, you know, that's, you know, thoughtfully written and not like, you know, once a day, the same thing over and over again, but a different thing that you've put in, you know, poured your heart and soul into genuinely. And, and you know, is not just like a, you know, shameless self-promotion and like, just like spamming the same post over and over again. Yeah, you, you're right. It's not spam. I, I was just, it, it was a joke, yes, but it's better to clarify. Maybe you can you can think about okay, what if another maintainer does the same post as mine? What is my re reaction if I read it? Like if I read Pedrag Pedrag's update about trust follower cargo server checks, I'm happy. So uh, may maybe you should do the same. Yes, um, we have another question from Orun. Thank you. Uh, how do you deal with burnout? What are the things that you do outside of, of software development? Definitely. In my experience, there's there are sort of two strategies here, and I think they're both important, and it's not an either or, you need to do both. One is to have things that you thoroughly enjoy doing that are unrelated to software development. So my things, uh, I love playing board games. Uh, I play some computer games uh, you know, with, with friends especially. Uh, I like to play ice hockey, uh, and that's something I do on a, on a regular basis. So it's not just you know coding that that gives my life meaning. There's there's all sorts of other stuff that that I really enjoy. And you know every so often, if you're frustrated with a piece of code or something, it can just be super useful to you know go out for a walk, go for a run, you know go hit a puck uh, a, a few times. It can be you know very cathartic to to overcome you know, mental load, mental burden with like putting some like physical effort into into things. And it can be, you know, very, very satisfying that way. I think the other uh, thing that is that is complementary to this is 
attempting to deal with the sources of burnout more directly by addressing them or by preventing them from happening in the first place. So uh, these are things like, oh my goodness, I can't believe that I need to do the same maintenance task over and over again you know, for no obvious benefit or for no feedback or, or anything like that, right? And so you can structure your, your development of your, of your package to try to avoid and minimize these, these kinds of situations. Uh, you can uh, be very explicit about setting expectations with your community. So for example, if someone opens an issue on Cargo Sever Checks and says, hey, uh, I ran Cargo Sever Checks and it didn't catch this obviously buggy, you know, broken, uh, you know, uh, breaking change in my APIs, here's an issue. Uh, I'll say, thank you so much for opening that issue. As you can see in the readme, there are lots of issues that we don't currently catch. You know, sorry about that. Uh, but, you know, because it's stated there in the readme, the expectations were set. And so it helps users not be frustrated when these things happen, because hopefully at least some of them have read the readme. Um, and even if somebody, you know, maybe hasn't dug into, you know, the, the right portion of the FAQ, I can still point to them to, to that. And it, again, it reinforces the sort of healthy dynamic between me and the community so that I don't get burnt out by being blamed for functionality that doesn't yet exist, right? And it's especially useful when, you know, people in the Rust community like to be very helpful and like to be positive. And so every so often, you know, when I say, hey, sorry, that's not implemented yet, they say, oh, would you take a pull request? And I say, great, I'd love that. You know, I will happily mentor. I will help as much as I can. And that's what happened with Marco. One day, you know, he he uh, opened an issue and was like, hey, uh, there is no API for uh, cargo server checks. It's a binary. It's not a library. I'd love to use it as a library. I said, that sounds great. I personally don't have time to, to do this, but I'll take a pull request. And lo and behold, there was a pull request, and now there's a library for it. So I think it's very important to be aware of the things that are causing you to move toward the burnout end of the, you know, that axis and to figure out ways to addressing them for, you know, preventing those situations from happening as often or from affecting you as negatively um, before you really get to, to you know, the, the bad stages of burnout as much as you can. Once you're really burnt out, it can take a while to, to come back. You know, speaking from personal experience, I think a lot of us have, you know, have gotten to that point at, at some point. Uh, and so it's it's one of those things, kind of like breaking changes where uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So better to not end up in that state uh, in in general. And uh, here I'll, I'll extend a, a, an arm out to maintainers everywhere out there. If you feel like you're getting burnt out, and you're not really sure what to do about it, please feel free to reach out to me on, on social media. I'm very happy to you know, take some time to, to chat and you know, walk you through some of my strategies, uh, hear you out and, and talk about what is getting you burnt out and just see if there's anything that I can do to, to help, give some advice, or even just you know, lend an ear and, and let you vent for a few minutes. Even that can be cathartic and, and helpful. Uh, that's something that I've had the benefit of uh, of doing with people in my community, and I'd be very happy to extend that courte uh, courtesy to, to anyone else out there listening to this. Yeah, thank you for your advice. They were really golden. Um, so I agree that like you should put boundaries. So like if somebody asks for a feature request, it's not mandatory that you need to do it uh, immediately. Like you can say, yeah, a PR is welcome. Feel free to contribute. And also I found very helpful to uh, to chat with um, your peers. So maybe other maintainers like you, uh, you, you, you can share your, uh, your issues, how they, you, you can ask how they deal with it. And so on. That, that's very helpful for me too. Yeah. So absolutely. And at the end of the day, you know, we're all in this together. You're not the only person running into the, the issue that you're running into whether it's burnout, whether it's a social concern, whether it's a how do I promote my project, whether it's a you know technical issue like my code isn't working. And so ask for help. Uh, a lot of the time, people are very happy to help if you post on social media, if you post on r slash rust, if you just ask a friend. Um, so just don't, you know, don't keep it internal. Uh, share with, with the community and, and people will step in and, and generally be very helpful. Yeah, there's nothing wrong to say like, uh... Okay, this is not the best period. I will 
for example, I will stop feature the uh, developing new features. People are, I think uh, they are really com comprehensive in these cases. Yeah, they, they understand, yeah. Uh, great, thank you again. Uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, what are uh, your future plans for uh, both Trustful and Cargo Semver Check? Yeah, for Cargo Semver Checks, uh, I would like to get it merged into Cargo itself. Uh, it's already great that it's used by a number of uh, highly influential crates out there in the ecosystem. Uh, everything from Tokyo to you know the Amazon AWS uh, bindings to you know parts of you know the the Mozilla browser and you know projects at Adobe and uh, a lot of other companies out there even cargo itself when it's uh, building its own internal crates is actually using cargo server checks to ensure server uh, compliance so this is awesome to see it's really good it you know it feels really good to to be helping the community and to be finding and preventing these server violations uh, as as they happen so Thank you to, to the people that have adopted it. And please feel free to tag me on, on GitHub issues where you see cargo server checks uh, prevent something that you know would have been bad if caught in production later. Um, I would love to keep adding more lints. I want to improve performance uh, for cargo server checks. I want to make it even more uh, capable and, and powerful. So there are a lot of new features that can be added. And if you'd like to support me on that road, uh, there's something that you can do, which is that you can sponsor the development of Cargo Server Checks uh, by becoming a GitHub sponsor. Uh, and uh, I want to send a big shout out to, to the GitHub sponsors that, that I already have that are supporting me uh, on this. It's been incredibly gratifying to see people sign up and, and you know pledge real dollars for, for the value that they're getting out of a, a tool like this. So thank you so much to, to everyone supporting. For Trustful, uh, my plan is to honestly just keep building. I really love building these high leverage tools that are effective, not just as cargo server checks, but also empower future Lint tools that haven't been even thought of yet, let alone built, and ultimately even bigger use cases out there. Like I mentioned, you can use Trustful to query any sort of API, any sort of database and things like that. But while right now, in principle, you could build you know, the adapter for an API or a database or things like that. It would be great to just be able to grab something off the shelf and combine it with a bunch of other data sources and all of a sudden be able to query across you know, GitHub and Crates.io and you know, the vulnerability repositories out there and uh, Hacker News and you know, company websites and I don't know, every data set that you could possibly imagine. Anything that you can think of as a structured query, you should be able to write and, and execute via Trustful with good performance, with good ergonomics and everything like that. And so I don't have anything concrete to announce there yet, but it is something that is has been very much on my mind and it's something that I'm very interested in and in building out. So keep your eyes peeled and follow me on social media if you don't follow me yet. Cool, awesome. Yeah, like um, I want to emphasize again the uh, sponsorship that you you opened uh, yesterday, I believe. Like you said that there are companies that are using cargo server checks, and uh, yeah, I want to say to those companies that cargo server checks is preventing many errors that uh, can happen to their developers, and like it's making them more efficient. So. Please, if you if your developers are using Cargo Semver checks, considering consider sponsoring Pedrag. Absolutely, yeah. Also, I think this tool is uh, is is great for the for the Rust uh, ecosystem. Yeah, I think it's essential. Uh, so these are the plans for, that you have for Trustful and Cargo Semver check. I don't know if you want to share some plans that you have for for you in the future. You said you're working on a Stilt uh, project, of course, is Stilt, but yeah, um, the TLDR is essentially I want Trustfall to be a credibly sustainable, credibly open source project for the long run. So it's incredibly ambitious as a project. Incredibly ambitious projects have a tendency to either disappear and stop being maintained because it was too difficult and too expensive to to sort of keep them running day to day, or to have a moment where they're like, oh, we're, you know, we used to be very permissively licensed and now we're going to change your license and we're going to be, you know, 
some less permissive license down the line. And that's something that I really don't want to do. Um, that, of course, means that there has to be a way for Trustful to be sustainable as a project while also being open source. And so that's the the effort that I'm putting forward in and you know working on this startup idea that I've been pursuing. The TLDR is Trustful is open source. I want to remain truly open source under the permissive license that it is today indefinitely. I want it to be a sustainable project just like you know LLVM is right now. So you can use it, you can build on top of it. It's not going to go away. It's not a you know dependency risk, a maintainability risk for you. It's a highly, you know, uh, bulletproof, highly performant, you know, not going to go away, not going to stop being maintained kind of tool that you can, you know, bet your company on uh, if if you'd like. At the same time, I feel like Trustfall is just step one on this journey, right? Trustfall is a way for all of these uh, data sources to be connected, for us to gain a lot of this expressiveness uh, over the data sources that does not mean that we are broken by all of the API changes and things like that. But that doesn't mean that API changes don't happen. That doesn't mean that you know there aren't a lot of additional ergonomics improvements, additional functionality bits and pieces, additional performance things that we might want that are not related to how is the query executed, but more you know about being smart about using those APIs to the best of those uh, to the best of their abilities. Right. So I'll give you a specific example. Um, when you use the GitHub APIs, GitHub has uh, these things called e-tags that it returns as part of the HTTP response that tells you essentially, has this resource been modified you know, since the last time you looked? And GitHub rate limits are fairly strict. But if you use these e-tags, then if the resource hasn't been modified, GitHub just tells you, hey, this thing hasn't been modified. And that request doesn't count against your rate limit. So this can be super important if you're trying to write some super expressive query over GitHub, right? Because without that, you might run into rate limits. With that, you might not run into rate limits. And so it could be very valuable to have a tool that knows how to plug in all of these little tricks of the APIs where it does predicate pushdown in the right places and takes advantage of e-tag and caching and things like that uh, to give you better performance, to give you more expressiveness where you didn't have it before. And also, hopefully, uh, you know, this is something where you can get more value than if you had built it by yourself, because there's honestly a lot of API surface area out there. It's not just GitHub that has this problem. It's every other API out there. And these APIs are ginormous. So why are we all building these integrations separately? I feel like anytime you have to integrate one API, it's a difficult time. If you have to integrate 10 of them as a company, I mean, you might as well spin up an entire department dedicated to integrating these APIs, and that ends up being difficult and expensive. So that's an area that I'm very interested in, in trying to tackle. And I want to reemphasize, you know, I've been working on Trustful and Trustful related ideas since 2016. It's not going away, right? It's been, you know, seven, eight years now. Uh, I'm hoping it'll be another, you know, 10 years plus that, that I'll still be involved with the Trustful project. Uh, but I'm hoping that you know my my next years are even more ambitious in in this kind of query space, rather than just sort of maintenance and a small feature here and there. So, if you're interested in in any of the stuff that I said, especially around integrating APIs, I'd really love to hear about it. Uh, please reach out to me. Let me know the the struggles that you're facing uh, with integrating APIs, and maybe there's a way that we can work together. Right. That, that's exciting, yes, absolutely. And it seems that you have so much experience on, on this field. You said that that you are you were the guy that was executing queries as a services as, as a service. You defined it as, as funny. I don't know if that's funny, but yeah, if you find it's funny, it's great that you're continuing with this uh, with this um with this path. Uh, yeah. so trustful I'll, like uh trustful and, and its predecessor have been deployed at, honestly, scale I would have found unimaginable if you had told me when the whole project started. We've queried everything from multi-terabyte scale, you know, globally replicated SQL databases to you know, some of the most complicated APIs that I've ever seen and everything in between. And 
honestly, a lot of the the stuff that we had uh, at the uh, previous startup that uh, I, I used to work at felt back then like science fiction and still today, many years later, feels like science fiction. So I feel like I have a pretty solid map of where all of this stuff is going. And I'm incredibly excited to, to share it with people as uh, as these things, you know, go from uh, being ideas in my head to real code that people can put their hands on and really, really try them out. Great. And yeah, for the people who want, for people who want to connect with you, uh, how can, where can they find you? What are your contacts? Yeah, the best places to find me are probably uh, GitHub issues. If the question is related to a specific project that I'm working on, or uh, places like Mastodon or Twitter, uh, if there is something more in general, please feel free to you know uh, message me directly or. Uh, you know, post and, and tag me, and I'll be very happy to take a look. Uh, obviously, you know, time is always precious, so I might not be able to get to everything, but I really love hearing from people uh, about how they might be using Trustful, what the, you know, good sides and bad sides are, or just in general, you know, people coming to, to say hi always makes my day. Great, great, yeah. Yeah, so uh, Predrag's contacts are in the episode description. Uh, Thank you so much for being here. It was a great conversation. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure to be here. And uh, I'm really excited about the podcast that you started. So I look forward to seeing uh, and, and hearing future episodes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> great. So thanks, everyone. And uh, see you at the next episode. Bye.